Welcome to the Invest for More Real Estate Podcast. My name is Mark Ferguson, and I am your host. I'm a house flipper. I flip 10 to 15 houses a year. I own 13 rental properties with a goal to buy 100 by 2023. I'm also a real estate agent. I've been licensed since 01. I run a team of nine. We sell close to 200 houses a year. So on this show, we like to interview house flippers, landlords, and the best real estate agents in the business. So stay tuned for some great shows. If you want more information on my rentals, on the numbers, how I buy properties, check out investformore.com. Hey everyone, it's Mark Ferguson with Invest For More and welcome to another episode of the Invest For More Real Estate Podcast. Today, I have a very exciting guest, Kathy Fedke with the Real Wealth Network. She's been very busy as an author. She's been featured on many major networks, loves to teach people about real estate and is an investor herself. So we're gonna talk about all types of different things, figure out how she got started in the business and um, what she is up to now. Kathy, thank you so much for being on the show. How are you? Wonderful. Thanks for having me. Oh, great. No, appreciate you, you joining us. I always start everybody out. I want to know, you know, exactly how you got started in real estate. What was it that triggered, you know, you to start investing or become interested? What first got you into it? You know, it was two things. The first was totally by accident where my dad had gone on vacation. He was a dentist. Notoriously, they are not great with investing. <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's it's true. And and so he had invested in an apartment and had depreciated it for years, but he was just a silent partner. The managers of that apartment sold it and didn't, didn't tell him, no phone call, nothing. He just got a letter in the mail when he came back from vacation saying that the property had sold, which meant that if he didn't find a replacement property and, and do a 1031 exchange, he would have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in back taxes. And he just was on the verge of retiring. And this would have changed his plan. So he was panicked. My husband and I had just gotten married. This was January of 97, 20 years ago, their 20 year anniversary year. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And I just kind of looked at my dad. He was, you know, in a panic and, and called. They didn't know what to do. And I, I said, wait, just slow down here. You're, you need to find a property, you know, like to rent. Well, Rich and I got married. We were renting. So I just said, let me let me help you with this. We'll find the property and we'll live in it and and take care of it for you. And so we did. The next day, I found a really big house because it was a big exchange. We had to we had to spend about five or six hundred thousand dollars. But this was twenty years ago, so even in the San Francisco Bay Area, that was a hefty sum. And so you know, I got to buy this six bedroom house right outside of San Francisco. Ninety seven was the bottom of that kind of down market, that cycle. And we didn't know anything about that, but bought the six bedroom house and just kind of turned it into a fourplex it, all by accident. It just made sense. We got to live in this beautiful, big new home in a great school district for, for our family and, and, uh, and then kind of discovered that we could live there very inexpensively by, by renting out these different rooms. So that's how we became landlords that, you know, living inside our house. But what I didn't know, and, and you know, we made a, an agreement with my dad, we'd take care of everything, we'd refi the house and pay him back anything he had ever put into this property or past properties as part of the exchange and pay the trust back. We ended up inheriting that property 10 years later after he passed. And it went from 500 because he, you know, he died at the peak of the market. They said we bought at the bottom in 97. So by the time we inherited, it was worth about one point eight million. Wow, that's so. a slight improvement there. <laughs> yeah, it was a crazy market, but keep in mind that was two thousand seven at that point. So it wasn't just; it was just a few years later that everything went back down again. So it was just a temporary moment of massive wealth. <laughs> <Right. laughs> it was gone. <laughs> Do you still have that property, or did you end up selling it? We again, you know, we were by then into real estate, but into it heavily. So because we had taken that property and refinanced it, taken a bunch of the cash out to buy other investment properties, it was really over leveraged and it was just negative cash flow. So we, we ended up selling it at a loss. That was a big bummer. It hurt. 
but lots and lots of lessons learned, just like every, every failure, every success, we learn so much, but we learn more from the failures, right? So we can have more successes in the future. Right. Well, and it sounds like it wasn't a waste. Obviously, you learned a lot. And if you're able to cash out money and buy other real estate, in the end, I'm sure it ended up being a great deal. Yeah. You know what, like I said, probably the best thing we got out of all of that, the run up, you know, this is, this is what I, why I'm passionate about what I teach people today is when we got into real estate, we only knew an up market for 10 years. So we didn't really know there was any other kind of market. And, and so every year the house we bought made a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, no kidding. Like we wouldn't really have had to work if all we did was just keep refining taking that $100,000 off out and living on it, which a lot of people did. We did something different and invested that money because of kind of story number two, which is how did I, you know, get more into real estate and create the Real Wealth Network and sort of, you know, do what I do today. And that is that in 2003, I think it was, it was 2002, I should really know. My husband came home from the doctor and was told he had melanoma and after more testing that they thought it spread and that if it did, he had six months to live. So he was in shock, healthy guy, you know, extreme athlete, very, you know, takes good care of himself. It was just a shock. So here we had this big house that we already kind of learned how to rent out. And so I said, well, let's just do more of that so you can get better and not work. And if the doctor's right, spend six months doing everything you want and it's spending time with our young children and with friends, like whatever, let, let me figure out the money piece. And so at the time I had a radio show on KSFO in San Francisco, and I just started interviewing people on how to make passive income. And we'd already kind of been doing it, but you know, at that point you really couldn't buy in the San Francisco Bay area. Like you can't, you know, really in a lot of places today. So we had to learn how to invest elsewhere. And that that's kind of what started me being passionate about finding the best places nationwide to buy income properties that create passive income. Now, the good part of the story, the positive side is that Rich is totally fine today, healthy as can be, and the doctor was wrong. That's good. That's, <laughs> yes, that is very good. And I saw him on your website, so I, I was assuming he's okay. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I know San Francisco is one of the toughest places in the country to invest in because you said the price points are so high. You know, it kind of has the same issue with Colorado, but multiplied where it's really hard to build anything. So there's no, you know, all you do is prices keep going up. <laughs> but so what do you look for in other markets? How do you how do you first start figuring out where a good place to invest is? Well, if people are looking for cash flow, so you know, if you're in the fifth in, you know, the age range of fifties or sixties and you're you're really wondering how how am I going to ever stop working? Because you look at maybe what you've saved in, in your investments and it's just not enough. If we're going to live as long as we think we're going to live, it, it probably isn't enough money. And so what I'm able to show a lot of people in high price markets like San Francisco is, you know, one tiny shift in their portfolio could change that scenario dramatically. And what I mean by that is uh, I'll give you an example of a woman that came to me 10 years ago, very similar market. Prices were already up way, way past previous highs and the affordability was out of whack. That was, you know, already in 2005. And this woman came to me and had three dilapidated, just awful old properties in the worst part of Stockton, California. But because the market was so insane, she could sell those for about 400000 each and they rented each for about 1200 so when she came to me, because I had, as I said, I had the, the Real Wealth Show in San Francisco and she heard me talk about what we were doing. She said, I want to I want to know what I can do because I want to retire and I hate my job. She was just working for a tyrant of a boss and had the dream of, you know, turning in that piece of paper that says I quit, you know, just walking out. <laughs> and so, you know, we looked at those properties and said, OK, if you sell this, you've got a one point two million dollar exchange we can go to a place like Texas and buy nine properties. And each of those properties is going to rent for the same amount that your three properties rent for in California. So we did that. We knew where the path of progress was in Dallas. You know, 10 years ago, we were following where our new freeway was were going in and, you know, where the new infrastructure was being built. And we, we helped her buy brand new homes there that, like I said, rented for 1200 each. So she tripled her cash flow. And, you know, you, you can imagine went from 
you know, like 3,600 a month to 90, you know, 9,000 a month and was able to do that thing and wrote down, I quit and handed the piece of paper to her boss. <laughs> that, that was probably a good feeling. <laughs> a great feeling. So that's, that's a lot of what we help people do is to see, okay, maybe you bought all right. You know, a lot of people bought really well back in 2009, up until about even 2012, you could almost buy cash flow properties in California. Like it, it, it you know, it was decent. And so a lot of people did, but since then, depending on when you bought, the values have gone up maybe three times. So now when you look at all the equity in those properties, they might've made sense before when you bought them, but now that's a whole lot of dead equity just sitting there that could be repurposed, like I said. So we're helping a lot of people who made smart decisions five to seven, eight years ago and are now ready to make another smart decision, which is to sell those and exchange them for high cash flow properties elsewhere. And that literally can be the thing that has them be job optional. Yeah, no, that's a great topic to talk about because I've thought about the same thing myself where, you know, I was buying properties for $100,000, you know, putting $10,000 of work into them renting them out for fourteen to $1,500 a month. And it was awesome. I mean, those are great cash flowing properties. You know, plus, I got great deals on them. And now those properties are worth you know, $250,000. And I'm getting maybe $1,600 a month in rent. And like mm -hmm. you said, there's so much equity in there. And when you figure out the percentages, I'm making you know, 5% on my money, which isn't very good in the real estate world. And you know, thinking, man, do I really, do I want to sell? Do I want to exchange? Do I want to go into different markets? And I have sold a few of my own properties to use that money to flip more houses. I'm buying some commercial things. So yeah, the, it, it's, it's tricky. You, know, you see a really good investment you made, but then it's like, well, do I want to make an even better one and sell these properties or do I want to hold on to them? But um, it, it's tough. Yeah. You know, it I, I, was at, I spoke at an event uh, in Orange County last week and kind of t basically telling them what I was telling you. And this woman in the front row said, well, I'm cash flowing in my California property. And I said, really? Tell me more. And she you know, said, I bought it for this price and I get this much rent. And I said, okay, well, what's it worth now? And she said, I don't know and I don't care. And that's, that's actually a somewhat normal and powerful response, really, because if you're just if you're just owning buy and hold real estate, you don't really necessarily need to think about the value because if values go up or values go down, does it really matter if what you're really wanting is the rental income? However, in her case, because the difference was so dramatic where she maybe spent $600,000 on this property and now it was worth $2 million, you know, I mean, it's that kind of, that kind of equity. I, I showed her, well, you know, you can go from this $6,000 a month that you're making and you, you could be making $20,000 a month. That's the difference that can change your life. And so that's what I'm constantly doing is educating people. Number one, how to just uh, repurpose their, their investments so that they, the, so that the, you know, you, you, again, you get more cash flow, but also to stop people from thinking that if they buy today, they're going to enjoy this massive run up that we've had over the past seven, eight years. Because that's what I see people do that is just the biggest mistake. This, this one woman came to an event that we had in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area and said, you know, very proudly, I just bought a fourplex in Berkeley. And I said, oh, my gosh, you know, are you cash flowing? And, and she kind of looked at me and was like, what, what do you mean? And I said, well, do you know how much you're getting in, in rents? And she was like, oh, no. And I said, OK, well, do you know what your expenses are? N not really. And I said, well, why did you buy this? <laughs> you know? And she said, it's Berkeley. It's California. Prices never go down. <laughs> and that is, that is, I don't know where people get that idea. Prices definitely go up dramatically in California, but they also go down. So if you bought it in 2006 or 2007 and you bought at the last peak and then you watched your values go down 50%, you're maybe 10 years later back to where you were, maybe slightly above what you paid. But that's 10 whole years of not getting appreciation because you went down and then a slow up. So, you know, don't buy at the peak of a market thinking that you're going to have another 10 years of run up. It just rarely, rarely works that way. I can't imagine that could be possible in a high priced market. It's certainly not in California or San Francisco or LA. There's, there's no physical way that people could afford properties that are double what they are today. I mean, this is not going to happen. Not right now. Maybe. Right. Yeah. And I completely agree with you on the strategy of there's a lot of people who buy with negative cash flow, just hoping prices go up and nobody knows for sure what's going to happen. You know, it, 
yes, you have an idea and you can follow the path of progress, but there's so many things that can change. And there's also a lot of other people doing the same things. And if too many of those other people are doing it, then prices might get, you know, built up too high for what the the people can afford. There's just so many things to look at. But, you know, like you said, if someone had bought in 2007 at the peak, but they had cash flow, then they're making money that whole time. It's not as big of a deal. But if they don't have cash flow, they're losing money that whole time. And when you do sell, you've got selling costs. There's just a lot of costs that are involved in real estate where you're not making money while you hold it. It can add up really fast. Absolutely. Absolutely. I hope people aren't doing that, but they are. People are doing that like crazy today. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So what are some of the different markets across the country that you like right now? Well, we like sort of the the areas with a bad reputation, I hate to say it, but when you can go into an area that, that, that the rest of the world doesn't even know exists, you know, if you, if you go to some foreign country and say, oh, you know, invest in, in the U.S. is a safe place to invest, they're, they're going to know L.A., San Francisco, Chicago, Las Vegas. You know, they're, they're going to know some of these areas, but they're not going to know Cleveland or Pittsburgh or maybe, maybe even Atlanta, Milwaukee, like you and I talked about before. These aren't cities that they probably even have heard of. And so because of that, you're eliminating kind of this whole foreign buyer element that has helped to to uh, drive prices up in some of the you know more well known markets. In fact, just I just did again another story on on real estate news podcast that said foreign buyers were the, the a number of purchases were up like forty over forty percent this year. So you know when that kind of money comes in and they're not really looking for the same things we're looking for. They're looking for safety. So they don't mind paying more. And in common, you know, it's very common that they drive prices up. So I want to be in areas that are kind of out of their sight and out of the sight of the institutional buyers and investors in general, but not just some random market. Like I've, I've heard people love to invest in, I'm going to be kind of mean now, but Jackson, Mississippi. And, you know, nothing from my data and research shows that there's anything fabulous happening there. <laughs> you know, I, I could be wrong. But it's just a pure cash flow play. And the only thing that scares me about an area that's only cash flow and no growth, no economic growth, no population growth, is that if you just need one repair, you know, a roof and, you know, just new pipes and plumbing, whatever, that's probably going to eat up your cash flow for the year. Whereas if you can get into a market that is just being discovered, it's a growth market, there's a revitalization happening there and you can get properties cheap but you know that growth is coming, then you get the mixture of high cash flow and appreciation like you did in in your state. And I'm sure a lot of those cash flow properties you bought were, you know, back before the growth was happening. So, no, that's, oh, right? go ahead. Yeah. Well, yes, so, for so, sure. Yeah. To answer your question, we know that we've got two massive populations in the U.S. that really are driving the economy. We've got the baby boomers who are retiring, and we've got the millennials who are just going out and starting their lives. And so they, these two groups are really going to you know, be the housing demand of the future. So we've got to follow where are they going. And you know, what, we're, what we're seeing is there is job growth in certain markets that where businesses have said, you know, forget all these high taxes and high property values and these high salaries we have to pay in California or elsewhere. We're going to go to a rather unknown place and we're going to put our business there because there's tax incentives. And we can pay people less and they can have a higher quality of life. So, you know, some of those areas would be, like I said, Kansas City, Cleveland, Ohio. This is an area that's become a huge medical city. And and so that serves both of those populations. The baby boomers want that medical care and the young millennials want to be in that business. You've got universities all around Cleveland, people who are coming out as nurses and doctors and, and in that medical world. And high paid and they're looking for housing. So it's a great market. I bought a property there for, I don't know, $55,000 and it rented for 900. It's it's definitely worth more today, but you can still get incredible value. Detroit is an area I avoided like the plague until recently where that area now has billions of dollars in revitalization. And yet you can still get properties for that kind of same price I paid in Cleveland years ago. You can get something for around sixty to seventy thousand dollars that rents for more than the one percent of purchase price. And there's you know, we want to be only in neighborhoods in Detroit that are in the path of progress. We don't want to be in the, the areas that are going to take longer to turn around. Oh, so there's that's just a few. 
Yeah, no, that's great. And I, it, it's weird. Cause I have a house in Cleveland too. I kind of bought it as a turnkey rental and um, I've never seen it. I've never even been to Cleveland, but <laughs> a company that I trusted worked there. And I, I have no idea what the value has been since I bought it. I've asked a few people and they've given me varying answers, but I bought it for 45000 and it rents for $800 now too. So yeah, I mean, there's definitely good numbers there. And then yeah. Detroit is one of the hottest real estate markets in the country right now. When a few years yeah. ago, people had given up on it and thought the whole city was going to implode basically. So yeah. it, it, <laughs> it's crazy. Well, you know, with some of the dynamics there, and these are the things that I look look at and share with my audience, you know, and when we do events and on my shows, you know, what, what is, what is responsible for changing Detroit from just, you know, a place where they were giving properties away, no one would take them, you know? So what happened is because of just the devastation from, from everything that happened to that city or crime was crime rose to like, I don't know, 50% rates. It was, it was just, just a scary place, but the city came in and tore down. They raised just thousands and thousands of homes so that, so that there wouldn't be the vagrants and there, you know, there, there wouldn't be the crime in those neighborhoods. They just tore the buildings down. And at the same time, the city went bankrupt and just kind of let go of a lot of debt that was weighing it down. And then a couple of billionaires came in who really care about the city, have businesses there, and they revitalized parts of it. And now it's become a real millennial magnet. It's amazing. It's kind of become a cool place to be, as long as you know where that is and where, again, where the path of progress is, because there's still parts that are really dangerous and you you definitely want to stay out of. So, you know, Detroit matches everything we look for, which again, is cheap, but with growth perspectives there, or I'm sorry, with growth, you know, in the future, and uh, and yeah, it's cash flow today and probably equity growth in the future. No, that's that's a funny story because you know, like we we've talked about before, the Colorado and San Francisco and markets going up in price because there's not enough homes. You had the opposite in Detroit where you know, prices drop through the floor because there are too many houses for the people there, but they just tore them down to fix that problem, which was actually you know a brilliant plan instead of just leaving them there. It seems like a waste, but at the same time, it probably helped their market tremendously. Yeah, I think so. They turned a lot of those areas into parks or or just you know completely revitalized them with new buildings. So it's really coming around. And like I said, certain parts are going to take longer than others, but that's what we look for. Even an area like Atlanta, where prices went up pretty fast and it's just like Denver, it's hard to get cash flow now, whereas it used to be a lot easier. It used to be a cash flow market. Now it's not. But there's revitalization happening in parts of Atlanta as well with the new Beltline which is very similar to New York's High Line. They're taking an old train track and and putting parks on it and little new cute neighborhoods around it. And and so even in a city like Atlanta, where it's been getting harder to find cash flow, you can go into those areas and get both cash flow and probably some appreciation in the future. Yeah, no, there, there's opportunities all over. And um, one other thing I want to talk about with you, which I know you've um, been working on too, is with it being harder to you know get cash flow, find good existing properties, you've been venturing into new construction. So how has that gone? What are some of the challenges with that business? Well, seven years ago, I had one of the members of Real Wealth Network come to me and say, you have got to meet this developer. And I, I said, I don't know anything about development. You know, what? why do I need to meet this guy? And they just said, just, just do it. So I drove down to Carmel Valley and it turns out it was just, oh, beautiful, beautiful home with a tennis court and horses and (laughs) like, okay, this guy's definitely established. And then I looked at his resume and he's developed property all over Monterey and California and San Jose and just all over for for 40 years. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll listen to what this guy has to say. It turns out that every single decade when there is a housing downturn or some kind of recession and properties go back to the bank, the bank's the asset managers would call him because they didn't know what to do with some of the assets, mostly the land. And he did know what to do with it. So he said, look, you know, I just found 27 townhomes, waterfront, 70% complete. They had the whole exterior done. It was just the interior that needed to be finished out. But the bank failed. The credit line disappeared in 2008 and it went to the FDIC. And so he was able to negotiate this $20 million project down to $3 million. And, uh, and he said, can you raise $3 million so we can buy this? Because he couldn't just walk into a bank. Banks just did not have money at the time. And so I said, I don't know. And I sent out an email to our list and said, hey, we've got this opportunity. Anybody interested? 
and we we raised the three million dollars in, in an hour. So I thought, okay, I I didn't know that there was an appetite for this with it with our investors, but apparently there is. So we ended up syndicating that. We raised the three million dollars, finished it out, and back in middle of 2010, right at the double dip recession, our investors got out of that and made about 20% IRR. So from there on, you know, this developer's name's Fred just kept finding more and more deals. He he found some land in outside of Tampa. It was it was $160 million. It had been an escrow and they were about to close when the market just crashed in, in Florida. And that whole project went back to the banks and Fred walked in, talked to the asset manager and walked out with that, you know, these 4,200 lots for one tenth of what it had been an escrow for. So once again, our group raised the money and we're just about to get those properties out, get them online probably next year. And we did the same in California. So I just, I learned that, hey, I'm never going to want to develop property. It's way too complicated and hard, but I will partner with people who know how to do it and have done it successfully for 40 years. So that's basically how, how we've gotten into it. And it's, it's very exciting, very lucrative with the right team. No, that's, that's a really cool strategy because I, you know, I try to build my own minor subdivision and the, the hoops you had to jump through just for a minor, simple subdivision with the county were incredible. And it was going to take two years to finish the whole thing, even though it was only like seven lots. And I'm just like, this isn't worth my time. But if you yeah. can jump in there after it's all been kind of platted and developed and approved, I mean, that's yeah. the way to do it. If you ask me, that's great. Exactly. And and with people who just know that business, it's like I look at you and say, boy, I, I don't know that I could do what you're doing, flipping so many homes and managing so many crews. And, you know, I'd rather buy and hold. But if I, if I tried to jump into the flip market, I'd probably fail. Whereas, you know, same if I tried to jump into development, I'd fail. But if you partner with people who that's what they do and that's what they know, then you, your chances are much better. That's what I tell people. If you're going to flip property, do it with someone who's done it many times. Don't don't try it on your own at first. Yeah. Nope. There's a lot that goes into it that's not portrayed correctly <laughs> by a lot of the world. So that's for sure. Yeah. Um, oh, very cool. You've got the new construction. Obviously, you're helping people invest in other markets. Anything else you want to share that's going on right now with you? Yeah, well, right now we're building, we're doing another syndication in Reno. Reno is a booming market. Oh my gosh, it's just four hours kind of east, northeast of uh, of the Silicon Valley, of, you know, San, San Jose and San Francisco, and but over across the border in Nevada. So a lot of Silicon Valley companies are, especially the startups, are moving to Nevada for the same reason they moved to Texas 10 years ago for the business incentives, the tax incentives. And the biggest news, of course, is that Tesla moved their battery factory there. It's a like a $5 billion project or something. And and then right after them, Amazon and Google and Switch, all these big, you know, big tech companies moved up there. So it's booming. There's not enough housing. So we are, we were able to tie up some land from a developer who kind of did what you just said. They they tried to get entitlements on their land. It took longer. They they finally got them, but they had also taken on a hard money loan and they they had to get out of it or they were going to lose everything. So we came in, we were able to raise the money really quickly and buy that land from them, save them from the hard money loan. But also we walked out with land that probably we paid what it, what it was worth before entitlement, but we got it fully entitled. So now we're just, we're breaking ground in a couple months. So yeah, we've got anyone interested in Reno, we've got lots of information on that city. It's, it's amazing what's happening there. Oh, that's, that's, that's great information. Can you cash flow in Reno? I'm curious if you buy existing houses. You know, it's kind of the same problem you're facing in Denver. You could, you could have three or four years ago. It's real tough now, but we are looking at building an apartment there and, and that will cash flow. Okay. No, great, great information. I asked that about every market, you know, kind of <laughs> always interesting to see what's going on across the country. Sure. Yeah. Well, great. Well, well Kathy, awesome information. If people want to get in touch with you, if they want to tune into your podcast, what's the best way for them to reach you? Sure. They can go to realwealthnetwork.com. That's our website. It's free and we give a lot of information on these different markets. We also have teams in the markets that we can refer people to, to, to help them find deals. And then The Real Wealth Show is my podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. Awesome. And I'll have links to both of those in the show notes so everybody can find you. And yeah, before we head out of here, you know, great information. Any, any tips or tricks for people who 
maybe they're they're looking to buy in another market and they can't buy in their market. What are what's a one good tip for them to watch out for? Oh boy, that there's so many, but <laughs> definitely look at the track record. There's a lot of turnkey companies that mm, they're anything but turnkey. I and mean, there was just an implosion in Chicago with a, a group there, a big turnkey group that you know they anyway. So I would say make sure that you see their track record and that you talk to investors to to know that you know they have happy clients. Check them check them out. Do the Google search, background checks, all that. But most importantly, make sure you get everything in writing and get your inspections and your appraisals so that you know I, I see too many people going into handshake deals and that's never good. Get get everything in writing and treat it like a, a real like a real business. No, that's great information. And Chicago scares me. You know, not only are their property tax taxes astronomical there, but the whole government bankruptcy talks and everything. It, it's a, it, it would scare me to invest in that city right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of unknowns. After, if they do go bankrupt, which I don't think they will, but if they did, they could go the way of Detroit, which actually it was good for Detroit. But at some point, you know, there's going to be a pension problem for sure. There is one. They just have been able to kick that one down the road. Yep. Yep. Well, again, great information. Thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, we'll have to keep in touch. Good luck with everything you're involved in. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great rest of your summer. All right, you too. 